Hello, and welcome back to another session of BHA Live, an ongoing series of educational opportunities being hosted by Barbershop Harmony Australia's Harmony Academy. I'm Dan Beckett, VP of Marketing and Development for Barbershop Harmony Australia. If this is your first session, welcome. Sit back, relax, and enjoy tonight's presentation. And of course, a big welcome back to those who have already had a chance to experience one of our Friday night sessions. Before I get started, I'll get a little bit of technical housekeeping out of the way. If you've joined us via Zoom, please feel free to use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves. However, if you have a specific question about anything being presented, please make sure you submit that by the Q&A function. This will make sure that the questions all funnel through and get seen. So with that out of the way, I'll introduce tonight's guest presenter. Vicky Dwyer has 20 years barbershop experience and is a specialist vocal coach, unlocking the tools to achieve vocal freedom and skills for singers of all ages. She understands and appreciates the nuances of the barbershop style to help you interpret your music in a way that shows off your skills. Vicky has directed choruses since 2002 and has a passion for mentoring upcoming directors, sharing conducting skills, as well as coaching in the areas of rehearsal planning, team training and interpersonal skills. She has an associate diploma in music with combined major in piano and singing. Vicky is a master director for the Circular Keys Chorus and also directs Sydney Harmony. She is also on the SAI Regional Education Faculty for Australia. Vicky currently sings lead with Alouette Quartet and previously competed internationally with Australia's four-time regional champion quartet, Accolade. She's performed and directed on the international stage numerous times, most recently earning a third place Harmony Classic Medal directing Circular Keys Chorus in 2018. She likes pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Vicky has a substantial background in both classical and theatre as well as barbershop. So it is my very great pleasure to hand you over to tonight's presenter, Vicky Dwyer. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Nothing like throwing in a request for cocktails in the middle of your bio. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight, I'm going to go through uh, some, some skills for conducting your choruses or your sections. Or if you're not a music uh, leader in your chorus, but you are actually interested in how you might communicate different things uh, in terms of gesture for, for um, indicating that through music, this, this class is for you. So you don't need to be a chorus director. You don't need to be a music team leader. You don't even need to be a, a quartetta. You might find these skills are useful uh, in, in just understanding your music. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, share my screen. I'm gonna bring up my PowerPoint presentation for you. All right, and hopefully you can see that. Uh, so what I'm going to go over in this is the gestures that show different events in the music. And this is a little bit different from, say, for example, conducting a band. When we conduct a band, we're just really maintaining tempo and, and some events that might be going on. But barbershop music is somewhat different. We don't necessarily expect our singers to understand the rhythms of the notes or the note values that are written on that page. And it's really up to the director to be able to uh, communicate that information to our singers so that we sing in sync, so that we have an agreed presentation of that song. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna go through some of the basics and you might feel like, well, I'm never going to use these in barbershop, but I think by the time we get to the end of this presentation, you'll see that they do have a, a use and, and we can all make use of them. So of course our traditional beat patterns, these are just our simple beat patterns of 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4. And I'm just going to go through what they look like when we're directing them. And so our 2, 4 has a downward stroke followed by an upward stroke. So if you can see me in the little the little camera over to the side, I'm just going to hopefully be able to show you what that looks like. Here is our two four, might have to stand up. So our two four just straight down out to the side and pulls back up again, straight down and pulls back up again. And there's a sort of a, a, a weight to that. It's not that which doesn't have any weight to it. It actually has a pull through and a weight to it. 
Our next one is 3-4 and this is a bit confusing for some people because when we do 3-4 I'm going to take that, that second beat out to my right. So I'm coming down, out to my right and back up to the top. So that's 1-2-3. 1-2-3. On 4-4, four, four, we're actually going to go to the left and then to the right. And this again, this takes some practice. It, it really does um, mess with our minds now that we're going to go into a, a change of direction here. So our 4-4 four, four is down, to your left, to your right, and back up again. Down, to your left, to your right, and back up again. And in the, the um, diagram that's on the PowerPoint presentation, you can see that there's kind of a, a, a lift and an over tracing of that pattern. I'm not sort of just, uh, 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 you know, making it very sharp. There's, a, there's a, quite a flow to it. And we can actually use that flow to indicate different things in the music. We have preparatory beats. And these are super important for when we're going to be taking a breath and also knowing what beat to come in on when we take that breath. So of course, once we've established eye contact with our ensemble, and then we bring our hands to our starting point, which is our ictus. And I'm gonna to have to stand up again. So we bring our hands to our ictus. And then what helps our singers know that they're about to breathe is to exhale. If you have already inhaled and you haven't given them the preparatory beat, they're most likely to do a double inhalation. They're going to go, and then they have to breathe in again when you give the prep beat. So we really want to make sure that we're giving them all that information in our body so that they know what's going on. So as I bring my hands to my ictus, exhale. And then depending on what beat I need them to come in on, my preparatory beat is going to go out or up and away from the beat that I'm going to. I'm going to go through those in the diagrams. If it's a one beat, this is fairly common, then my hands are going to take the beat up to the one to come in on one. So that is our breath. So I'm going to exhale. One. I hope you're following along at home. Two is a bit tricky. Of course, I've done this as a 4-4 uh, four, four beat where the two would go off to my left. Okay, so in this case, my beat is going to go up and away from the two in order to come in on the two. So I'm going to exhale, take my breath, two, three, four. We think of plenty of times when our singers actually come in on the second beat of the bar or even the end of one where we can still use this as a function. Beat three. Now, of course, if this was a three, four time signature, this would be two. But we're just, I don't want to confuse you on that. So beat three is going this way. And so I have to prep up and away from that beat. So this is my ictus, and I'm going to prep three. And again, three, four, one. All right, so I'm just going to do that in the full pattern. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Here's four, four. And this time I'm prepping to beat four. Again, we have this all the time where we want to come in on the fourth beat. So we're going to prep away from it. So I'm going to prep this way in the three beat so that I'm ready to come in on four. So I'm going to exhale, breathe in. Four, one. And just your body gesture, just the fact that you're breathing and doing that at the same time really helps your chorus to understand what you're trying to, to give them, to indicate to them. Releases are when we want to either take a breath, uh, when we want to perhaps even release into a a consonant sound like a percussive something like that we might need a release when we might want someone uh, for example if the if we finished on the word I can't even think of one but uh, if it was a t at the end of it we might use a release so that everyone landed that t at the same time now one of the things that we never want to do and you've probably been told this a thousand times or you've heard it we don't want to do the chokehold release that looks like this 
for this, right? Because our singers, they experience that as someone actually, you know, closing their throat. We don't want to do that. So we have different ways of releasing. Um, so the first one is just, it's called a touch or a tap off. So in that case, I might be going one, two, three, four, and that was my tap off. And you could see it there. I'll do it on a different beat just so you get the idea of it. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, so these are to be practiced. The next one is a circle cutoff. And so there are some moments where you want to really bring their attention to where that circle cutoff needs to be. And so this is can be done clockwise or anti-clockwise. But what we're doing is we kind of make sure that the tail, which I consider is my little finger, finishes up in the direction where the next beat is. So we're going to go through some diagrams of those. In this first one, the tap off is at the end of one. So we would call that on two because I've already directed one. And that just looks like what I had before, which is one. And of course my tap is heading this way. So I've got one, two, three, four. So nothing happened over here for two. Let's do that again. One, three, four. Our next one is the cutoff happening on three. So I've got one, two, four. And you can see I didn't use that whole three space there and I didn't use the whole two either because if I did my hand would be way over here and I wouldn't be able to get back to go to four. So I'm kind of evening off those two, that amount of geography to do this one. I'm going to do that one again. So I've got one, two, four. And I could put that even closer to the two if I need to. And that's something that you would practice and figure out how it fits in with the rhythm of your song. On four. So you can see my messy line there trying to be, you know, showing you how to two, three. And oh, that's a funny one. I've gone kind of like out and around to get back to four because I want to point in the direction that I'm heading to. If I did it and I went one, two, three, and then went that way, I might not be able to get back to four. I'm not saying it's wrong. You can do that. But the, the rule is that you would go one, two, three, four, right? And of course, I'm going to miss out four. I'm coming back to one. So I'm going to show you that. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. Hope that made sense. The last one before I ask any questions is going to be tapping off on one where we proceed to two. So this is at the end of a pattern. We've finished four and, and we're not going to sing one, but we're going to go straight to two. And that looks like this. One, two, three, four, two, three, four. So I didn't come back through one. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and seeing if there are any questions on this now. Dan, have we got any questions? Uh, yes, we do have one question so far, Vicky. This is back from, I think, when you have showed your first set of patterns. A question from Alex who asks, is there a reason for going left before right or can you do it the other way? <laughs> the, the, the reason for going that way is that the... The person watching you uh, will be able to determine straight away whether it's a, a three beat or a four beat pattern. Whereas if we go the wrong way, that's actually setting them up for um, the the two, like one, two, three, four, rather than going the other way. I'm hoping that made sense. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. I think that did. I think that did. Uh, that's what we have at the moment. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right, so we did our releases. And releases are probably tricky. All right, so now I'm going to look at why we might use beat patterns and how we can actually mess with them a little bit. So I'm going to look at our um, BHA uh, C 
song uh, I still call Australia home. I was trying to think what we call them. And I, I'm like going, polecats, polecats. That's what they're called. Our BHA polecat, I still call Australia home. And look, this is, it's in 3-4. And, you know, our singers, you know, if, if they were able to read along with the music, they would be able to see that not all of the notes are actually the same note value. And so this is where it comes down to, well, if we were playing another instrument, if we were playing this in an orchestra, it would be up to the, the instrumentalist's responsibility to actually know exactly what those notes and their values are on the page. For barbershop, we're not even reading the music, right? So a lot of the time we've learned this and it really comes down to the director and how they're going to direct it. So if all they did was a 3-4 pattern on this song, it really doesn't give any indication to our singers that some of the notes are going to be held for somewhat longer than just a single beat and some are shorter. And so how do we do that? How do we get our singers to know what we want when we're uh, directing something like I Still Call Australia Home? Now, one of the things that we, we see with perhaps, you know, someone who is less experienced in directing is that they tend to do what we call one ones. And that's like play, playing the notes like a piano, right? So it might be, I've been to cities that never close down. So we have seen that, but it's not an effective way of directing. It's not effective because one, it would be quite choppy. But two, when we're giving too many gestures, too much information, then our singers tend to become a little bit numb to what we're giving them. And so we want to be able to give them gestures that are relevant and they are specific to the events that we want to draw their attention to. So if I was going to direct this song, say for a group that has never sung for me before, and they might have some sort of a, a, an understanding of what the song is, but maybe in their ensemble they sing it slightly differently, uh, so we're going to look at this song, just a little bit of it, to show how a different pattern might actually be, you know, uh, a more beneficial way of showing what you want from this song. Oh, I, I'm just going to jump to the next thing because that's going to explain what I was just talking about. So beat patterns have more uses than just to maintain a tempo. Uh, we can slow down one or more of the beats within the pattern to give greater effect. So unlike a band conductor where, where they are just keeping tempo, one, two, three, one, two, three. In barbershop, we can actually change the lengths of those, those conducting patterns. I might want to go one, two, three, one, two, three. Maybe I want one, two, three, one, two, three. And I can then have the opportunity to give my singers different information from my gestures. And then we can meld between different patterns to allow the singers a sense of flow and or urgency to pull them back to a target beat in a phrase. And we can suspend motion between the beats to allow for accents, breaths, a pause into a pickup. And so what melding does is I'm un, you know, sure that the music says that it's in 3-4, but that doesn't mean that my beat pattern has to be in 3-4. I can do a mixture of beats to be able to get my singers to understand where the events are in that piece of music. So back to I Still Call Australia Home. And so, of course, yeah, we got three beats at the beginning. So it really does make sense to just do a three, four pattern there, right? So I would have, I'm going to have, ah, uh, but then I've got crotchet, dotted crotchet, quaver. So this doesn't really make sense anymore, right? Because that'd be, I've been to, right? And the t is halfway up this this beat here. I've been uh, two, right? So that's not going to help our singers if they really don't know what the rhythmic uh, changes were in the song right there. 
So what I've done, I've just drawn on this piece of music with a 2-4 beat pattern. I know it looks a bit wonky, but just bear with me. So our first part of it would be a 3-4 pattern. Ah, I've been to cities that never, and I might want to do something slightly different, but never close down from. So that full part, I could just get away with doing a 2-4 beat on it. Then we've got a slight change, which is New York 2. And on that moment, I've drawn a very wonky 3-beat um, pattern. So I've got New York 2. And the length of those strokes that I would have for that 3-4 pattern are actually going to indicate how long those notes are, are going to be held for. So it's not your standard three beat pattern where every one of those lengths are the same. So I would have New York 2. And then I might go into leaving it as that because it's the same. Rio and, and now different, Old London Town, back to 2-4. But no matter how far, or, and now 3-4. How wide I? Now at this point, I generally get a lot of questions. So I'm going to ask Dan, are there any questions on this part of it? Sure. Uh, actually, we're, we're clear of questions at the moment. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so if anyone has any questions in particular, feel free to jump in and put them in the Q&A section now. You have, a, you have a, a few seconds to type quickly before Vicky moves on to the next part. No, I think, I think we're okay. I think we're good to move on. Okay. Uh, actually, we have a, a very quick question. Sorry, it's coming to the chat room. Someone's asked a, a basic question. Is Vicky mirroring? Do we go left first or right? I am so not maybe, mirroring. No. And I did that on purpose so that it would be like real life, you know. Um, so, yeah, my piano is actually on my right. Does that help? <laughs> Which would be your left. So yeah, so Vicky raises her right hand. We can see. <laughs> there we go. Does that answer? Yep. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, Vicky. I did actually think, you know, if I was going to teach this class, mirroring would be really handy. You know? mm. <laughs> but but then my music, I don't know whether that would also be mirrored. I don't know. Anyway, oh, I got another chat in there. Sure, we do. I think this is a question too. So um, the question here is... Um, uh, this, or more a statement. There is some subdividing expected by the chorus. So I think he's, he's, he's referring to things like that, uh, perhaps in that second line, that old London town, but no matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's really, you would design your own melding patterns based on what you want your chorus to do. This of course is quite basic what I've done and and the reason I did this is because quite often as directors, we get asked to uh, direct at a mass sing where everyone has a different interpretation of the same song. And so doing something like melding really draws their attention to where you want those pulse points. Whereas you might have someone that just sings, you know, I've been to cities that, and there's no actual, you know, rhythms in it. So uh, this is to give, give some real pulse points. And sorry for anyone who thinks that they actually sing like that because no one does, no one does. All right, so moving on. Uh, when we're doing a ballad, of course, now it's different. This is rubato. And so when we look at the interpretive opportunities in a ballad, we look past those rhythmic elements, the note values, and instead we're working towards the most dramatic musical and lyrical product. And in this situation, the time signature is almost ignored. So rubato means that we rob from Peter to pay Paul. So we're looking for the ways in which we can address events that are happening in the song. So we think about our barbershop ballads. We have swipes, we have echoes. We might have one part holding while another part has to pick up and, and join into the, into the chord at some different point. And so if we were just stuck in note value, I mean, in beat patterns, we can't do that. And if we don't have something specific to kind of draw people to where they want, where we want them to be musically, 
then we miss those opportunities. Again, our chorus members aren't sure what, what it is that we're gesturing towards. So they kind of become a little bit, I don't know, like it's a, it's a guessing game. You moved, therefore they did something, but it might not be exactly what you wanted. And this is our way of kind of drawing their attention to exactly what we want in a really meaningful way. Of course, it does mean planning. We have to plan how we want, firstly, our interpretation of our music, and then from that interpretation, coming up with what is the best way that we can direct it, what are our conducting gestures that are going to make that information clear and concise. No guesswork. So I've picked Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly, simply because the, the dots on the page, apart from pitch, but the rhythms of them are nothing like the way we sing it. So if I looked at this, I've got uh, one, two, three. On a Sunday morn, sat a maid forlorn with her sweetheart by her side. Which, yeah, cha-cha-cha, that would be fine, but that's not how we sing it. We sing it as a ballad. And so we think about, well, you know, this is an opportunity to, to look at melding as a way to experience this particular song. So of course we're coming in on beat four and so I've written that above the on a. Uh. And then I've looked at this as using a three beat pattern for Sunday, Sunday morn, sadder. Now I know this is common time. I know this is a four four piece of music, but we're going to switch between all of those beat patterns that we've just talked about to be able to experience where we're going to put one. And we generally want it to be on the front, front of each measure because that's where the pulse point is. And so then we're looking at how we can draw that through each of the measures. So I've got honor and it's going to be on a Sunday morn, sat a maid for lawn cut off wither. So I'm just going to do that again. So you can see, um, so my red uh, numbers that are written on top of the, the measures there are indicating what my beat patterns are. And the two, the two lines that I've put there is the breath mark. So I'm just going to do that again. I will stand up just so you can see it a bit better. So I've got, I'm going to prep so that I can be ready for beat four. So I'm going to exhale, inhale. On a Sunday morn, sat a maid forlorn with a sweetheart by her side, cut off through the. All right, now I'm sure there's going to be questions now. <laughs> or if there's not questions, maybe someone who's out there would like to actually have the opportunity for me to watch them direct and we could actually make this a little bit of an interactive masterclass. Yes, that's a good idea. Uh, we don't have any questions still at the moment, Vicky, but um, this is a call out to all attendees. If there's anyone there who'd like to perhaps join in uh, and turn this into a bit of a masterclass. Um, you can raise your hand. Now I've seen someone raise their hand. This is you, John. So hopefully you have a, a camera there. So let's see <laughs> if we can bring you into the bring you into the discussion. So this is the first time I've promoted someone up to being a panelist. So hello, John. You are you are now in the class. Um, and here we are, we can see you. How are you, John? Hi. Hi, Hi Vicky. Hi, how are you? <laughs> You're a brave soul. Oh, well, uh, you know what I'm going to not do. <laughs> I don't know what you're not going to do. <laughs> a beat pattern in four all the way through. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's right, because we don't want to. Um, so, so, John, I don't know whether you can see this particular um things still on your screen yeah and no, i've got it okay did you want to give it a go yeah all right okay oh, oh sorry it's all right and i'm going to make your screen a bit bigger hang on oh i can't do that 
Let me see if I can swap John and the music. Is that okay? Let me give this a try. Yeah, I can make this it will bigger make on the... my screen, but I don't know whether that makes any difference for anybody else. Um, not for anyone else, probably just for you. What I've done, I've just swapped the, 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 your screen with the video now. So, John, do you want to try that again and see? Sorry, can, can you see my hand? Yeah, it's just a little bit blurry, but it's all right. I can make it out. All right. I'll just bring it down a bit. <laughs> okay. Oh, I need to see the music, though. All right. Um, okay. I might do what you did and just sort of say it so it helps a bit. Yep. Um, uh, exhale. Oh, no. On a Sunday morning. Oh, it's the other way. Oh, God, it's so hard to get this right. Sorry. On a Sunday morning, Saturday may fall on with a sweetheart for her side. That's enough. <laughs> that was pretty good, John. That was pretty good. Yeah. And so I couldn't see where your elbow was heading to. Would you like to do it again so everyone else can see? And I'm going to ask you to just tuck your, tuck your wing in a little bit. Okay. All right. On a sun... Oh, I've got to keep writing. It's a three-beat pattern, that first one. Mm -hmm. On a Sunday morn, Saturday made fall with her sweetheart by her side. I'm not sure what to do with that sweetheart by her side. It felt a bit clunky, just a four beat pattern there. You're absolutely right. Do you think that you could dissect it? Oh, wait, do it in uh, a two four instead? Oh, okay. Sweetheart All right. by her side, and then cut off, come in on two. So you're just suggesting a, a two beat pattern on that? Yep. Okay. On a sun, oh, start again. On a Sunday morn, Saturday made forlorn, with her sweetheart by her side. Yep. Well done. Thanks, Yeah. yeah. Any. Was it was it hard to once you had that three in your head? Was it starting to make sense? Yeah, it's it's just like um, you, it takes time to 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 sort of get your head out of not thinking in a four beat pattern um, when the song is written in four beats to the bar or common time. So your just body is not expecting to go into a three beat pattern in the first full bar. Mm. So it's just like, I just found it really difficult to get my hand to go across to two in that direction, which is just for a three beat pattern. Um, so there's, there's that sort of cognitive thing that you've got to be doing as well as then, oh, looking ahead to the next bar and you know, you've got, you're back to a four beat pattern, but you've got to cut off. So, um, so yeah, that's how I felt about it. It just took me a while to put that all together. Um, and I certainly find at this stage actually verbalizing the, the interp in, through the words just to help me guide my hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and John, it's interesting because you've actually been uh, experimenting with, with the melding concepts. Um, for those, you know, for complete disclosure, John actually sings in my chorus and, and I've worked with John on, on some directing skills as well. And it's, you've now been using um, this to kind of explore your own music now. Uh, how, you know, what, what kind of wisdom can you share as someone that is just embarking into this? Um, so, the I think Vicky's idea of looking for events um, in the, the, the ballad is such an important idea for uh, gaining insight into how to make an interp for 
um, for a ballad. You know, so for instance, uh, someone who's a lead in a quartet could use this idea of events to help them develop an interp for a ballad. Um, and so they don't necessarily have to then conduct that, but um, this, this structured way of looking for the events, um, it means that the, the, the lead can then sing to the rest of the quartet um, how he wants or how she wants the, um, the, the rhythm to be, the interp to happen and where the emphases are in, in each, each part of the, each bar of the song. So, well, Vicky, you did that quite a few times there when you tried to explain how you got that sort of rubato effect happening by getting the events. I found that a really useful concept, the, the whole idea of an event as a way of, of developing your own interp for a ballad hmm. yeah. rather than just sort of thinking, oh, I think I'll sing it this way, you know, because then you don't get any consistency between um, performance before, between different rehearsing. Uh, when you, every, every time you're rehearsing a piece, if you haven't decided where the events are, then the lead is not going to have consistency. And, of course, the conductor won't either if the conductor's doing it. Yeah. So it's, I find it, found it to have been a really useful tool in terms of um, developing my own interp of, of a ballad. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, Dan, do we have any, have, have any questions uh, for me or for John there? Uh, yes, we do have one more question from Lynn. And Lynn asks, uh, when you hold a longer note, does your hand or arm move further or just more slowly? More slowly. Uh, it sometimes i might even bring in another hand to mirror that hand uh, particularly if uh, let's say it's getting towards the end of a song and i might have that and then i can continue to build out the end of the phrase that way to to make it more meaningful and purposeful but yeah i'm not going to take my arms uh, way out because that tends to weaken the sound as soon as your singers see you with your arms out a long way or up a long way, then that, that really does uh, take away from their core strength. So, so they're not going to sing with as much uh, supported sound. So if we keep our hands within the same support structure of their instrument, it helps them to really think about what it is that they're, they're doing subliminally. They're not really, you know, they're, they're watching what you're doing. And as long as you're maintaining uh, good core strength and good support in your own instrument whilst you're conducting, they tend to mirror that. They tend to do the same. But yeah, on a, on a big, big note, if I, if I suddenly lost my mind and decided that I was going to direct it up like that, um, I, I imagine that they would uh, sing somewhat splatty and out of control and a bit screamy. So, so yeah, I keep everything within that sure. space. Yeah, um, I suppose too it also gives... gives um the singers a clear indication of how long something will go for as well. So if they, if they don't know how far you're moving your arms every time, then they can't really be prepared to support their sound throughout that whole motion, can they? That's exactly right. Yeah. If they know where you're going and it takes you a while to get there, that they can kind of see where they're coming to the end of it. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Uh, okay. Now that's all we have for now. Um, I'm going to move so on now. Sure. Thanks. If you don't need John for the, the time being, I'll put him back into, I'll, I'll send him thanks. back to his seat. Thanks, thanks John. John. <laughs> Bye. All right, I'm going to uh, move on. Uh, I did have a little bit more of that for Wait Till the Sun Shines, Nelly, but uh, previously when I've taught this class, it has been uh, very much a workshop where we would sit down with the music and everyone comes up with their own interpretation of it and then they get to direct a piece of it. So um, once this comes out for you on, on YouTube, feel free feel free to do that. And if you wanted me to give you any feedback on that kind of stuff, I'm happy to have a look at your work and, and let you know what I think. So just moving on. Oh yeah, look, I've written at the bottom here that once your singers know what the interpretation is, you can actually start to edit your, your gestures. And so, so when you're starting a song and you, you've written out what you want your interpretation to be, where the breaths are going to be, where you're going to have you know, specific dynamics, uh, where the swipes and the echoes are, how you want to direct those. 
you know, uh, anything like a suspended breath or a pause or something like that. You put that all on your music and, and really study that, which probably seems a bit nerdy, but I'll tell you what, preparation in, in those early stages helps to iron out any, any problems down the track with your ensemble. If you're just sort of winging it, you know, every single time that you, you know, when you start a new song, then the chorus kind of, they don't learn it that well. You know, if you're prepared and you've got everything there and you've gone, right, here's my interpretation and we're going to at least start from this point. And of course the interpretation is going to evolve. But your singers are more invested in it if you are. If you show that you prepared, then they're going to be more prepared. They're going to look at their music a little bit more seriously and differently and take on that information. So, yeah, once we get to that point and you... Um, Obviously, we want a singer-driven chorus, and that means they have to know what, what it was that you wanted in the first place so that they can then carry that out for you. So this is all you know, stepping stones to a really great finishing product. So let's have a look at some in-tempo songs. This is tricky. When I, when I watch people directing an in-tempo song, um, quite often they let the ensemble set the tempo <laughs> maybe not at first but you know after a while if the ensemble's dragging then then the director tends to just match the drag whereas what we want to do as directors is we want to have that that metronome built in we want to know what is what is the tempo i'm going to direct this at and my first breath has to be in that tempo but i also have to have my hand a smidge in front of the beat all the time so that idea of, of, you know, really knowing where those pulses are and keeping the hand in front of the beat while you're doing that, and that takes some practice. Uh, so I've just got here, um, apart from staying in front of the beat, plan for interpretive changes that are coming up. So you can give appropriate gestures. Again, in an up tune, you have to be ready to give that gesture before it arrives otherwise we're going to miss it we're going to we're going to be that little bit behind and then what do they do well then when they're a little bit behind they actually rush the next two two words or syllables which is kind of i, I can't even think of a song right now because i've been you know in in isolation for so long but if if i was i don't know it was can't buy me love for example and i'm going can't buy me love can't buy me love can't buy me love oh i buy oh I buy what's going to happen is they go oh i buy you a, and they rush that next couple of words after the breath because it wasn't in tempo and they're going to try and catch it up but of course we have a sync nightmare when that happens all the voices are not together okay so we're going to edit to limit repetition so when we're doing this, yeah, I'm not going to stand there and beat four beats all the way through a song. I'm going to limit it down to maybe just a one at the start of a measure. And once, once I've established that, I might need two. I might need two beats for something. And then maybe at times within that, I might need the four beats to just indicate what those events are that are happening for our singers to watch out for them. Uh, pulses on or between the beats can allow emphasis and or accent. So when we're thinking about uh, also changes within the within the song, when we might have triplets uh, that are happening, or maybe if we're in three, four, and we've got a hemiola where we're using twos across a three beat pattern. And for those who uh, wanna ask what that is, just pop it in the chat and we'll maybe we'll get back to that. Okay, so pulses on or between the beats allow for emphasis or accent. So we're looking at it kind of like this this fun looking bow. We're coming down through one and then we've got a pulse where this little X is. So we can see this X here. So it's coming down, up and across. There's the pulse. Down and around, there's the pulse. Down and around, there's the pulse. Down and back up again. And so what that looks like, it's a bit of an ellipsis but with a, a, a middle part to it. If it was just the ellipsis, we're missing out on that first beat. So an ellipsis might be a way to just keep people, you know, I don't know, chilling. <laughs> but it's not going to show them where one is. So we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you can probably see that my hand has a, a little bit of a, 
not a bounce but kind of like a, a, a spot where where that little X is and then the one next to that which you can see that it's a little bit sharper and this is providing even more of an accent on the off beats so the ends the ends become far more um, obvious and so with that one it's it's kind of got a somewhat more spiky look to it I don't really like using the word spiky because I don't want it to be choppy but it's one and two and three and four and one so you can see where hopefully you can see where that was ah so this particular song uh, I used it for a workshop back in February and this was about experimenting using either of those two beat patterns that I just had the slide up for uh, sort of showing where you would give the, the different entry point for um, so for example we've got da 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 so in that first measure and so to have that you'd probably want that that feeling of Da, 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 so that you've got all of those subdivisions within that bar to be able to indicate when those um, different notes are and then later on once they've got it you would then just calm it down right so you don't need to do nearly as much you would edit what you're doing with your hand then we might have something um, I will come for you at night time and we've got that do that's coming in on at so if you're having a look at the music there with the basses coming in on that extra do, I would maybe even use my non-dominant hand for that. So I will come for you at night time, da 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 da. And that helps, um, I certainly use my left hand uh, a lot for my bass clef singers. And if it was a, a right-handed thing, for example, let's say my basses are holding something and I've got to bring my right hand back in, or if my um, treble singers are holding something, I might bring my left hand in to indicate where that is. I'm predominantly a right hand director, but I will use my left hand for pickups and I will use my left hand for shaping something. So I might want you know, a particular shape to happen in, in the vowel or something like that. Uh, yeah, diphthongs, things like that, where, where there's a specific change that needs to happen. Um, my left hand comes into play there, but that's that's another class. <laughs> that's that's an, another realm again All right, so I'm just I think that's all I had because yeah, it was practice time after that um, So Dan, let's let's go back to the the crowd <laughs> of However, however many people decided to sure tonight. We st Yes, we still have still have quite a few people watching and listening um, So we don't have any active questions at the moment though. Let me just double check through the chat and the Q and A. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to jump in now. Um, we have another raised hand from John. Yeah, I'm going to stop um, sharing for a moment. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Uh, John has raised his hand again. I don't know, John, did you have a question for Vicky or have you, is it still raised from before? That might be what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Let me just have a quick look. No, I think that's it for now. So okay. we're about to wrap things up. So if any more yeah. questions start typing quickly and we'll see if we can get to them. <laughs> uh, otherwise, as Vicky mentioned, all of this will be available for viewing later, or you can just contact Vicky directly. Uh, what's the best way for people to get through to you, Vicky, if they want to have, ask another question? Uh, through my email, which is vicky at dwyer.net. Great. Um, thanks, Vicky. Now, John has asked a question. Uh, uh, I think he's asked to see another example of pulsing. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> so on a four beat pattern, so if a, a general four beat pattern is just one, two, three, four. And as you can see, each of my, my um, as I'm going through that are two, it's no longer on the same plane. One, two, three, four, it kind of comes up a bit like a Christmas tree. When I'm pulsing, this ictus point becomes a little bit more um, obvious. So it's one and two and three and four and. So 
So it's one and two and three and four and. And you can imagine that, you know, if you're using, you can you can see that this is this is actually more of a. Oh, hang on, I need a different colour pen so you can kind of see it. But if I was if I was conducting an orchestra, this one would become much more obvious. So it would be one and two and three and four and. <laughs> but in barbershop, one and two and three and four and. And you can kind of. I'm hoping you can see that there's more of a kick up to it. All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's it. Any more? I don't think we have any more questions. We do have another just a thank you to say thank you for that uh, presentation. I have a new appreciation for the complexities of directing. Um, and I think that's, um, that's that, that, that is true. Once we sort of get into the, the nitty gritty of this sort of thing, it's easy to see how much more detail there is and how easy some people make it look. Uh, John has asked, um, is there a song? Is there a song? Is there a song? Would you like to sing a song? <laughs> I might know. need a little bit more detail around that one. John? Did he mean like for homework? Maybe for homework. Maybe with a, is there a song with pulsing? Oh gosh. Um, sure. Tons. Um, do you mean in in barbershop world or okay i'll, I'll give one um so for example there's an arendale arrangement um for another guy who felt you know da 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 so it's a swing da 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 ba, da 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 which gives you that that real feel of of a pulse it's the only one that could immediately jump into my head i'm afraid i can't think of any others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's... Strip tease has a good pulse to it. There you go. <laughs> but that's 12 8 for anyone who, <laughs> who really wanted to know. <laughs> and, and, and possibly not contestable. I'm not sure. I don't know. Depends if what, mm. what you're saying to Context. it. Context. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to ask a performance judge on that one. Uh, thank you, Tony. Look at me now, Aaron Dale. Contestable. That's the one. Yeah. Yes. That is contestable. Yeah. I think a lot of us have sung that. In yeah, the I think past. OC Times sang it. I'm trying to remember. That may be an OC Times song. Yeah, yeah, they did used to do a lot of Arendelle charts. Yeah, but you know, even Oh Darling, uh, Ringmasters, that's got a mm. definite pulse to it. You know, which, where you would need to draw out that that uh, backbeat a little bit more strongly. Yeah, that's true, and a lot of that, and a lot from the Arendelle. Um, catalog, I guess, of arrangements. A lot of that sort of slower swing tempo ballad, I guess you'd call it, yeah. um, fits into that category too, where you have a lot of that pulsing going on. So yeah, and of course, if you were doing an up tune and you're switching into a stomp, that is a great way of indicating to your singers that the stomp is a, is there. Stomp is imminent. Stomp is there. So always <laughs> making sure that you give everybody a, a good prep to know what's happening. Sure. Great. Well, thank you. I think that's it. That's it. I don't see any more questions or raised hands or, or chat comments. So I think we've, um, I think we've reached the end. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you everybody Not a for problem. joining us on a Friday night. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Thanks Vicky. Thanks very much. Thanks for that session. Um, so just as we wrap it up, if there's any aspects of this session, that anyone watching would like to revisit. As we mentioned, this video is available, well, available right now on our Facebook page. Uh, otherwise, keep an eye on the YouTube channel for BHA and you'll see um, that this will come up in the, in the coming days. So um, check that out. You can either look at the link that I've just pasted in the chat or if you go straight to YouTube and search for Barbershop Harmony Australia. Uh, or another option is just to go to the BHA website barbershop.org.au and follow the links to BHA Live on the homepage. Uh, now we have a fun session in store for you for next week. Our next session is called How to Impress the Judges. And this will be hosted by three members of the Australasian Guild of Barbershop Judges, Kieran O'Day, Rob Sequira and Ash Schofield. Now they are going to give you an insight into the judging process and fortunately they have the music, singing and presentation categories covered. Uh, performance, I should say, that was a typo. <laughs> the performance category. Um, I'll hear from Ash during the week on that one, I'm sure. Uh, so, keeping in, uh, so please, guys, keep an eye out for the registration link. It will be emailing it out as well as posting links on our social media channels, or you can just keep an eye on the BHA Live page on the BHA website. 
that this will list all scheduled upcoming sessions as well as providing links to our previous sessions. So a big thank you again to Vicky for your session tonight. Thank you everyone for watching. Have a great weekend and we'll see you all next week. Good night.